So welcome everyone to this first ever session on um, our Scale-Up programme. i um, very excited to have Dave Crubbers here, the CEO and co-founder of VoxPopMe, a Birmingham company who have scaled internationally very successfully as well. Um, and Dave's going to talk to us about his journey, both from a personal point of view um, and also um, the, the company as well. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Dave to do a quick quick intro um, into who he is, um, who VoxPop me are, um, and, and then what we're going to do is kind of open it to the floor for, for questions. So over to you, Dave. Perfect. Perfect. Well, yeah, nice nice to meet everybody. Uh, when uh, Yanis uh, contacted me with the opportunity to talk to uh, other entrepreneurs and tech founders from, from, from the Birmingham area, I was absolutely kind of delighted to uh, take the opportunity to just... Uh, share some thoughts about the journey that we've been on over the last uh the last eight years i'm uh, extremely envious of you guys at the stage you're at um i think you're at the what i call the fun stage uh not that it doesn't stay fun but it's uh it's 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 always the most exciting uh stage in my opinion um that kind of early stage where you kind of you know you, you've got this idea and you're you're taking uh taking that out and getting feedback and building prototypes and, and kind of, um, you know, kind of getting your first customers and first revenue. So yeah, very envious of, uh, of you all, but hopefully um, over the next 90 minutes or however long we've got scheduled, uh, I can impart some of the many mistakes uh, I've made over those, those eight years. Um, hopefully there's some uh, useful nuggets within there. And, you know, I think as you, uh, as you grow a company, um, every day is different every every six months the challenges change um they you know it never gets any easier but the challenges get different um and and, and i think kind of you know when you're first starting the you know you're, you're kind of validating that idea and there's a lot of work to do and and you've got kind of this this nucleus of an idea and and and, and you know as you as you start to scale you you have to hire you have to get customers you have to think about you know, uh, f governance and structuring that company and fundraising and, and, and many, other, many, many other things. So it really is a, it, it really is an incredible journey. Uh, and something that over the last eight years has been uh, incredibly rewarding for me, um, just from an experience perspective, you know, to go through all of the different um, things that we've been through building the company and um, all of those different they, um, kind of life experiences uh, has been has been incredible. So I'll start with just giving you just a short intro to the company, who we are, what we've what we've done, and, and where we came from. I'll keep it pretty brief because uh, I'm sure the questions are the the, the the key thing that people people want to get into, and happy to go deeper on anything. I think what you'll find with me is a, a very transparent founder uh, uh, in terms of the experience, what we've been through, and 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 kind of very open to 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 kind of admitting and putting hands up where where things went wrong and we got it we, we didn't get it right so um yeah vox Pop me started in in birmingham in 2013 uh i was birmingham born uh grew up uh grew up kind of in solihull and went to light all school um and you know set um vox Pop me up off the back of a digital agency that i used to run so the company used, i used to run was called one result it was kind of a mixture of a digital agency and tech accelerator kind of incubator people would bring us ideas we'd take equity uh, we'd start building building out tech for them and help them raise money and it was kind of uh, a, a great experience but uh eventually we I got tired of building tech for other people that maybe didn't always have the the grit and determination to take it from an idea phase into uh into a real into a real business and spent a, spent a lot of time building some some great tech that never really got off the ground um, because I think one of the biggest attributes I think um, I see in successful founders is a grit and determination. Like there's all, they, there, there isn't kind of, they just don't accept kind of uh, not succeeding. It doesn't mean that they win every time. They have to iterate and adapt and, and things like that and overcome. Um, but they spend a lot of their time kind of, they, they, they just have a figure it out mentality. And I think that's the biggest, biggest thing that there's an intellectual curiosity and a will uh, and a brute force to say, hey, we're going to we're going to get this, get this over the line. So started Vox Pop Me. It's a video um, feedback platform, essentially um, founded on the basis that we knew that, you know, the, the world was getting more consumer focused. You know, customers have so much choice these days as to where they spend their money, what brands they interact with, what products they buy. 
Uh, and the way that companies were getting customer feedback, we felt was was broken. You had surveys, things like SurveyMonkey and Qualtrics, which were great for giving you kind of the what, you know, very qualitative, how many people think this, how many people prefer red versus blue, whatever it, whatever it might be. Um, but there was no way of getting really rich kind of feedback, like the why behind many of those decisions. So we built a video survey uh, platform, which had a, an app that consumers could download and earn money by participating in these video surveys. Um, and from, from there, um, very quickly um, started to get interest. So our first uh, customer was Asda, uh, then Man City Football Club. Um, this was almost before they were a big club as well, uh, or devolve, devolving from the Premier League as, as it appears to be. But um, yeah, we um, you know started to get some good and in, uh, uh, initial traction, and over the last um, I guess uh, seven years, have really kind of grown uh, companies now. Sixty five people, uh, we're around six million in ARR. We raised twenty three million dollars. Um, I moved to the US about five years ago. Um, off the back of a strategic partnership that we built. So my co-founder and our CTO, Andy, is still very much based in, uh, based in, based in Birmingham and about half the team are still based in, uh, based in Birmingham as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's been, it's been an in, in, incredible kind of journey. Um, we're expecting to probably raise a Series B of about 25 to 30 million in the next six months. Um, and uh, yeah, so kind of heads down at the moment on kind of execution uh, and getting to kind of 10 million in ARR. But um, yeah, I'm happy to kind of talk through more about uh, any aspect of, of that journey for our, um, you know, raising money, which always seems to be a massive uh, topic of interest for people for obvious reasons, uh, hiring great talent, building product teams out, uh, sales comp and commission, um yeah i mean you name it i've kind of seen it all over the last eight years and um yeah i'm happy to share some of those experiences so it'd be great to hear you know some of the challenges you're dealing with right now and um, um, you know uh, yana sent through the buyers of the different companies so i had a chat opportunity to have a have a quick glance at some of those but looking forward to to learning more wonderful cheers dave um yeah sounds like you've been on a an incredible journey and um yeah, the fact that you're trying to get to 10 million ARR and um, raise that money um, and still giving up your time, um, I think says a lot about kind of you and, and the organisation. So once again, thank you very much. So what we're going to do is just do a quick round robin. Um, I know you've had the profiles, but I think it'd be nice just to get everyone to to say uh, a quick hello um, and, and introduce themselves and their organisations. So um, no further, I'm going to start with Asha. Hi Dave, I'm Asha. Uh, I'm a clinical psychologist and founder of Innovating Minds. Having worked with high profile murderers and sex offenders, I wanted to work at the other end of the spectrum to be able to support uh, schools, create mentally healthy environments. Uh, so we've built an online platform. We used to deliver face-to-face -face services. So to scale our impact, built an online platform to take schools through that journey to creating mentally healthy environments. As a social enterprise, we also support children impacted by domestic abuse. So we've just changed that into a facilitators program using a membership uh, portal for us to be able to train facilitators across the UK to be able to support more children, access early intervention. Fantastic. Wonderful, thanks Asha. Um, Rich, over to you. You're on mute, Rich. You, yeah, is, Do it every <laughs> time, don't you? Um, <laughs> Uh, hi Dave, good to meet you. Um, I'm Rich, founder at uh, Kaidu, um, sports scientist by background, so used to work in professional sport with the likes of Leicester Tigers, Worcester Warriors and the LTA. Um, founded Kaidu in 2016, uh, initially back then to try and make sense of sort of consumer generated health data, so the likes of Apple Watches and Fitbits and all that good stuff, um, very quickly realized that wasn't going to be possible without any access to data. So that was my first uh, mistake as a, as a founder, but I've sort of persevered, I guess, for the last sort of three years and landed in this space. We are now sort of employee well-being. So got a product now that is a sort of well-being and team building tool for um, remote and hybrid teams, as you can imagine, pretty relevant in the last yeah, yeah. Uh, the last 12 months. So um you know, I guess my 
real reason for joining this this cohort is we've gone from a position of pretty much being ready to shut up shop to growing up you know past past 150 200 uh, clients in the last 12 months and uh, lots of different challenges now so we support some of the largest the likes of hsbc who run our programs globally right the way down to sort of 20 person startups uh, and above and really just in a space now trying to understand how we acquire more customers rather than the sort of organic growth that we've been in um, to date and then how do we build that that team around it and is funding part of that roadmap i suppose Fantastic. Congrats. Cheers. Now Yanis is on mute. Now I'm on mute. <laughs> there you go. It serves me right for, for kind of saying it <laughs> on mute. Um, so I'm going to go to Simon or Sam or both um, to quickly introduce themselves and wonder. I just jump in, Si, because um, I've actually met Dave as well. I've had the pleasure to meet you already. Um, but just in case you don't remember too much about what we do just so everyone else on the call as well but um, we're a social learning platform that connects community groups who are learning about the environment climate change and social impact so we're really seeing the, the changes in the educational tech market go from kind of course and curriculum through to more community driven and social learning so we help creators and educators build communities around their goals and drive impact in those topics and then we help them monetize you know through experiences whether it's events courses workshops even content and allow them to make a monthly monthly recurring fee off that. So we're entering the lifelong learning market, which is around $800 billion and accelerated due to the pandemic, et cetera, with so many people going online. Uh, we're building a technology to connect those people. And a part of what we're working on at the moment is really how to constantly increase that growth and that reach. And it's interesting to hear about your work with partnerships. I think it's a big topic for us at the moment. And even for anyone else on the call as well, uh, one of my key things is, you know, how can partnerships be leveraged to expand and scale that growth? But pleasure to see you again. And Sai, if you want to... Yeah, yeah good, good to see you again, Sam. Um, hi, Dave. Nice to meet you. Um, yep, so the other half of uh, the co-founders at Wonder. Um, my main responsibility is at the company more internally facing um, and some of the kind of key things that we're working on at the moment, Sam's just mentioned a bit around the awareness piece and, and the partners, but... I think what we're finding there's like kind of key levels of our growth is first of all that awareness and getting new communities onto the platform but then the second part of that growth is giving them a good time and the su customer success part of that so particularly at the moment baking in those processes obviously the product's got to be up to scratch to to be able to handle that growth but then also what's the process we need alongside that um, as a company as well to make sure we onboard these communities successfully so those types of challenges and problems of building out those departments are something I'm particularly more focused on at Wonder at the minute. Pleasure to meet you. Makes sense. Good stuff. Cheers, Simon. Um, hey, Mark, we'll go to you next. Thanks, Yanis. Uh, nice to meet you, Dave. Um, I'm you. CEO of a company called Credit Car. Um, we've been going since 2018 and um, we're a pre-approval decision engine and we use AI to automate uh, manual and writing decisions um, uh, that lenders typically make. Um, but we also um, uh, automate the compliance piece uh, when finance is being sold to a consumer. Um, what all of this allows us to do, it, it allows us to speed up the finance journey um, by um, embedding finance in, in, into a customer journey. Um, and yeah, so, I mean, in, in terms of the, the challenges we've got at the moment, it's a bit more around prioritization. Um, in terms of the, the banks <laughs> and the companies we're trying to work with, um, because I mean, obviously we're, we're in a long list of people that want to integrate with them. And are there any hacks that will allow us to kind of climb up that prioritization ladder? That's, uh, that's us. Perfect. Thanks. Thanks. Um, congratulations for being in the Sunday Times this weekend as well. That was a yeah, very Sunday. cool. Thanks. Um, so next on my list, we're going to go to Chris Woods at CyberCube. No problem. Um, Dave, great to meet you. And it's great to see a fellow Brummie, actually, who's an entrepreneur. <laughs> so I should firstly mention that off the back. So uh, I'm the founder and the CEO of a company called CyberQ Group. Uh, but before I tell you a bit about my company, it's probably worth just giving you a bit of background. So I've been in cybersecurity now for about 25 years. So started life working for a, a company called Fujitsu as a penetration tester, then went on to a company called HP, Hewlett Packard, where I was the director. So basically building global capability. That took me away from Birmingham. 
uh, up until about four years ago. So from HP, I went to the Middle East, went out to Qatar. And then uh, as I tell people, I had my midlife crisis day at the age of 39. Uh, so I needed to start my own business and Cyber Q Group was created. Um, so Cyber Q Group, really, we're a, we're a cyber innovator as well as doing, should we say, the bread and butter cyber security services. We do a lot around innovation, around the risks. We do a lot on the dark web. We do a lot on the deep web. Uh, we do something called human reconnaissance, which is digital footprints of individuals. And we've grown rapidly, really, over the last four years. We've got offices out in Ohio. So we have a US base where we raise a little bit of money. Uh, our center of excellence is based in the Philippines. So obviously, my background working at HP, uh, building global capability came kind of natural. Uh, and again, when I came back to Birmingham, we just kind of building that customer base. Some of the customers that we've got, we've got, I mean, quite fortunately, some $5 billion logos on our books. Um, DPD, again, another local business. It was called Parcel Line. I don't know if you remember that, Dave. Uh, mm -hmm. Back in the day, most of Birmingham used to work for Parcel Line at one point or the other. Um, so again, on, on the back of that, we've kind of grown and grown and grown. But the purpose of joining this is one, obviously, we'd like to support Birmingham initiatives, being a passionate Birmingham myself. Um, and two, just to grow our customers, because we've grown organically and we've grown well organically globally. But it's just because we're good at what we do. And for the kind of metrics that we need, we need to get customers. We need to get more customers. I want to say quickly. Uh, but for us to make the targets that we want to do. I mean, I've got loads of questions about raising. We've kind of raised a little bit of money to get us ourselves out in Ohio. I really wanted to go out to the US because that's the biggest cybersecurity market in the freaking world. So there's, you know, compared to Europe and, and APAC, and that gave us, a, you know, gave us a position to, to actually attract a few customers, which fortunately we have. But obviously, it'd be good to hear kind of your story uh, about fundraising, how you got the customers. We haven't fundraised to date, so we, it's all it's 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 bootstrap growth, um, mm -hmm. which is it's got positives and negatives around that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I'll, I'll be interested to hear your thoughts on that. Anyway, Yanis, apologies. There was two and a half minutes, so I, I grabbed thirty seconds after. But good to meet you. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Chris. That's all right. I'll let I'll let it slide, Chris. Thank um, you. <laughs> <laughs> and from one um, one Chris to another, so um, over to Chris Thompson. Hello there, Dave. How are you doing? Um, so my name's Chris as well. I run uh, You Smart Thing, uh, and we guide people to venues and events the smart way, uh, is, is what we say, uh, which basically means we've got an easily embedded travel assistant product that embeds on people's websites. And uh, our destination clients license the product typically to be able to design a very, very bespoke route to their, uh, to their uh, destination, which could be anything from a, uh, uh, a football stadium through to a, 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 a hospital or, or, or university campus, uh, or, or indeed a festival. I mean, we just won a huge contract with um, the uh, Coventry UK City of Culture for our sins, which we're uh, very pleased uh, about. And the second reason uh, they licensed the platform is because unlike Google uh, Maps, they get a really rich data set back from us about who's traveling, where from, and how. So they can start to use that from an operational perspective, but also to monitor things like their carbon footprint and nudge behavior change and such and so forth. Um, we are kind of two years in. Uh, we were hit heavily by COVID, given what we do, but we managed to sell into the transport uh, operator sector very successfully last year. Uh, so we're all guns blazing now. Uh, considering about international expansion, probably for us, the next raise isn't for another 18 months or so, but we're uh, um, uh, interested to sort of hear, uh, uh, hear stories about that. And finally, I was one of your first customers. Um, I, I used to work for an organization called Cogent Elliott, a creative agency here in the Midlands. Yeah, yeah. Many with. yeah, yeah. And um, we used to work for Atos on a project called Red Spotted Hanky. And I needed some uh, a, a product to do some customer survey work. And they were looking at the traditional channels. And I said, have you seen this thing called Vo Vox Pop Me? Uh, and so we licensed that and we did a great job of getting some good Vox Pops when you have the very accessible model for smaller businesses, which I think is, I think you've gone a few steps away from that business model. So got some familiarity with your journey from the customer. Yeah, yeah. Uh, great to hear. I thought I recognised the name. <laughs> yeah, cogent perhaps, indeed. Cool. Um, over to Cooper. Oh, hi, Dave. How are you? Yeah, good, man. 
How you doing? Good, good, good. I'm very good, very good for a Monday. Um, so yeah, what are we? We're an organization called MyPam. Uh, we're basically an, an analytics platform uh, that uses uh, machine learning to help organizations make smarter, um, better informed hiring and sourcing decisions. Um, so when you look at your journey, you know, when you guys have gone from having 5, 10, 15, 20, 60 people, et cetera, um, you know, how do you kind of go about looking at aligning that kind of need with where the business is going to be. Uh, so we work with organizations to look at how are they recruiting their current talent at the moment? How can they improve on that? And then actually help them to match the talent they're looking um, to the organization a lot better. Um, so we develop, we've got our MVP developed. Uh, fingers crossed we're hopefully bringing on our first uh, major customer in the next uh, couple of weeks. So now that we've done it, we're kind of looking at how do we onboard the as you know, all those type of things, bringing that together. Uh, and then we're obviously going to be developing uh, the second phase of that, which is a kind of culture matching quiz and how we do the talent uh, relationship process part of it. Um, in terms of where we are right now, uh, of course, there's four of us uh, and we're looking to grow further. Um, so we're probably looking to increase the team of about six or seven this year. Uh, we're going for a pre-seed uh, funding round. Um, in terms of... Um, background um this is my second entrepreneurial journey uh, funny enough before this i set up a company called into ambition which is basically focused on developing a um, careers model uh, in schools and how we're going to use tech and we actually work with the light hall school um, so i know that school very well um I, you know learned learned a lot of lessons from there in terms of you know you, you know what it means to kind of raise investment and then you sort of got to run really hard really fast but if you haven't got all the pieces in place, the impact that that can have, um, the pressures of having investors versus hitting KPIs and how does that look? Um, so for me, you know, we took that to about what we had forty people at the top end. Um, so you know, this journey is about okay, how do we kind of jump that curve, right? How do we go from just having 40, 60, 80, you know, hundred people plus? But most importantly, how do you kind of scale that business in line with that? Because as you said, this phase of it is so exciting, right? Everything is happening. You've got mm-hmm. the kind of the freedom of the city, right, to do different things, but it changes as you start to grow. So it'd be really good to kind of pick your brains on how did that happen for you guys, the lessons you learned, uh, et cetera. So, yeah, there we go. Apology, Absolutely. Alice, I've probably taken 10 minutes. No, uh, it's all good. It's all good. Cheers, Cooper. Um, go to Russell next. Hi, Dave. Thanks for joining us. Uh, no worries. Um, we're creating, I'm Russell, co-founder of Senpai. We're creating a digital lean toolkit to transfer true lean capability to the hidden heroes in manufacturing. So it's lean and manufacturing. It's for manufacturers turning over 20 million or more. And they're currently unhappy with the fact their factories aren't performing well enough, quality cost delivery, because their leaders aren't sharp enough, good enough and skilled enough to improve them. So our product is a digital lean toolkit for use directly on a tablet on the shop floor. And it's a way to upskill. It's personalized for the user's skill gap. And it's also relevant to the fires burning in their particular patch. And it delivers an ROI improvement against their performance. It's better than the less relevant and less engaging classroom slideshows book style training. The two things, if I could pick your brains, uh, the two things I'd be after are, one, how do you make sense of user feedback? And two, how do you build a roadmap rather than just having a massive wish list? How do you know which <laughs> to go for in what order? Yeah, yeah. That prioritization is always a challenge, but yeah, I've got some, got some thoughts there for sure. That's great. Thank you. Cool. Um, if we go to Theo next. Hi, Dave. Nice to uh, meet you. Um, so, yeah, me, so. my name is Theo um, from a SaaS platform called Franscape, uh, which probably isn't going to sound very sexy, but uh, it's still an interesting opportunity for us. Um, so we're in the franchise space. It's a it's a uh, it's kind of CRM ERP system for franchisors. Um, and uh, it was born out of um, identifying that there was literally nothing that could meet the needs of these kind of people. And I say these kind of people, I am one of these kind of people. Um, I actually own a quite a substantial franchise business called Swim Time uh, that uh, operates, we normally teach about 20,000 kids a week when there's not COVID all over the UK. And the challenge I had when I had that business was understanding what the hell was going on in all the far flung corners of the country. There was nothing I could find off the shelf that would give me that kind of data to help me run the business better. And we ended up creating it. And then we fast forward to COVID and when the whole world was shut down, we thought, what the hell do we do? And uh, a lot of people came knocking on our door asking for our tech and uh, we formed a SaaS. So we're less than a year old. We've already got 
uh, about 11 major clients on board already. And we're just about to process our first million uh, through the platform gateway, which is pretty incredible. And yeah, the thing I'm really interested in sort of learning from you is about scaling. So we're, we're finding a lot of growth pains, um, particularly around sort of the system now is, you know, was built for a, a piece and now it's doing a very different piece and everything's creaking at the mm-hmm. seams. And um, I'm running out of reasons, what they say, the reasons why trains late, you know, I'm running out of reasons to explain to a customer why no the system le- doesn't no quite leaves, do. No leaves on the line. Yeah, exactly. Or, yeah. or the cow, cow's escaped or there's an ostrich run yeah. off. Um, yeah, I'm in that kind of space now. I've, I can't really explain anymore why something's not doing what it should do. So yeah, it's about scaling sustainability. Really, is our mission. So yeah, look forward to hearing your thoughts. Yeah, yeah. Sounds, sounds great. There's, there's so many questions I want to answer already, but I'll, I'll keep going with the with the intros. I think we're nearly done on the on the guess who board we're looking at. We are, we are, and I think yeah. that what'd be nice actually is once we do the, the last two intros, is you've probably already got a few buckets of themes and questions anyway. So we'll we'll go straight to you, Dave, and you can just kind of answer some off the cup and then we can go back around the room if anyone's got any kind of relevant questions so um from um swimming to cycling um and will i'll come to you <laughs> hey dave nice to meet you i think i literally just dropped off then maybe you guys can hear me okay yeah yeah um, all good great yeah, yeah yeah um no again really inspiring to to have you here i'm really thankful for Janice for setting this up so my name is will i run a company called energy uh we are a smart tech low carbon engineering company based in birmingham that make gym equipment that generates clean electrical power. Um, so we have systems which can be integrated into existing gyms uh, to make them low carbon, sustainable and eco-friendly, as well as a home product going out to the market in about six weeks time, which is a spin bike that generates clean power that can power your home office for a day from a single workout. Um, we are currently 10 strong, um, primarily engineers, so marketers um, and administrations. Now we had a seed round that ran from the end of last year that's going to take us through to the end of this year. Uh, we're currently at the point of, of imminent launch. Uh, so lots going on, lots of moving parts, lots of things going on. I'm finding the more people I hire, the more busy I become, um, which I would, <laughs> would have thought it was supposed to work the other way around. Um, but yeah, I think really my main kind of key pressing points to, to learn from you are things such as, you know, scaling effectively, that priority list that a couple of the guys have mentioned um, and, you know, selecting the, the right path, uh, making sure that it's, mm-hmm. uh, it's true to, to the company and making sure that it takes us to from A to B into the right the right way forward. Um, but yeah, excited to learn more. Cheers. Bye-bye. Good to meet you, Will. You too. Well, and last but not least, we'll go to Don, who's got a lovely branded background. <laughs> hey, very on brand. Uh, hi. Yeah, so, uh, can you hear me clearly? Yeah. Yep, perfect. Yeah, so uh, my name's Don. I'm the CEO of Connigital, stands for Connected Digital. Uh, we're on a mission to digitally uh, uh, support autonomous vehicles to uh, en- enable mobility for all. So we're a driver's vehicle and ride hailing business, and we offer uh, mobility as a service as our offering. Uh, we've been voted a top 10, a- 10 AI company by Vodafone and Intel. Uh, we've secured uh, about 5 million to date uh, in terms of funding and grants and uh, investment. And this is all so that we can test our MVPs, so our driver's vehicles in real world trials. Um, despite COVID, uh, we, we, we still, we managed to secure about a million in sales through uh, POCs. Um, and believe it or not, we actually made a small profit. Um, our challenge now is to get bigger and better uh, MVPs with, with potential commercial partners and successfully successfully make sure that we're ready for our series a and it's ensuring that we've we've we're on the right we have the right milestones we have the right uh, stats uh, key performance indicators that enable us to be ready for that series a that's the big challenge for us right now fantastic sounds a great business thank you wonderful and then i'm just going to quickly let, let chris Blackwell say a few words because then um, Chris is my co-lead on the, on the program so it'd be nice for him to just kind of intro himself. Hi Dave, nice to meet you. As Janice said, I'm the co-lead on the on the program so looking forward to this and uh, I guess um, I'm, I'm not really here to throw questions in but uh, just one thing I'd be interested to hear about and one thing that we talked about um, last week at the launch session was the importance of environment and the people around you and how that can kind of drive ambition 
if you've got the right people around you. So I just, just would be interested in, in the space uh, around the questions, whether that's been part of your journey, whether you've had people that have sort of inspired you, uh, who've been around you, or, or people that have kind of, you know, shone a path a little bit for you, or, or people that you've walked alongside uh, that have kind of helped. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, if you want me to start there, as, uh, as that's the one question I can remember. <laughs> yeah, I've made some notes, so don't worry. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah go, go for it, Dave. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think for me, people are everything on the journey. Uh, and that comes from um, employees, mentors, how your family supports you. Um, and, you know, with, with, without all of that, it's kind of, you know, it's difficult, right? There's good, there's good days and the good days are great and the bad days and the bad days are really, really bad. So unless you've got a great uh, support network, you know, there's a reason why, you know, there's a high rate of failure within startups. There's a reason why there's a lot of founder uh, burnout after, you know, five, six, seven years, because you, you know, you, you get up every day and you run through a wall and you have to keep running through that wall. And if you decide to take venture money, then, you know, the best analogy of taking venture money is uh, you run on a treadmill and every three months someone comes along and, you know, adds a couple of degrees to the incline and adds a couple of points to the speed. And, uh, and you know that they're going to be back in three months time to do exactly the same again. Um, so you just have to learn to, uh, to run, run quicker. Um, when I think about kind of people I surrounded myself with, I think, uh, at the, at the start of it is, you know, having a great co-founder. Uh, I don't know how many of you have got kind of co-founders, maybe a show of hands of people who've got co-founders. Okay. So yeah, about, about half the group, right? So you know, for me, that was a really important thing. Well, so I had a, a technical background, a development background. Um, I was uh, I was far from a from a, a developer. I think uh, David Maidman might be listening in on this call, so he'll certainly attest to that. One of our uh, former employees who who now works as uh, Sam and Simon. Um, but you know, I had a, I had a really really strong uh, co-founder um, Andy who I'd worked with for a few years before, um, and that 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 was critical. You know what I mean? It, it, we we agreed up front kind of what role we were both going to play with in the business, who was going to, you know, do what, what were our natural skills um, within there. But by, by having a co-founder, I think it, it just gives you someone who you can kind of be candid with. You can be honest and, uh, and, and frank with, I know there's, there's definitely some, um, you know, there's quite a lot of data out there about kind of the number of like unicorn SaaS businesses that have single co-founders. I think it's uh, Zoom maybe uh, and Slack and a couple, you know, but, but overwhelmingly uh, venture capital prefers to back multi-founder teams than single founder teams. Uh, and it's not to say you can't get funding if you are a single founder, but it's definitely something you're going to want to address in those early funding conversations is, you know, prove that you've built out, even if it's not a fellow founder, but you've, you've got kind of people that are around um, for the journey. Um, the second thing I would probably add is just about the, the ability for finding a mentor or a coach. Um, you know, I think, and I, you know, I love sports analogies, so bear with me with this, but, you know, uh, even Tiger Woods has someone who coaches him how to play golf. Um, and, you know, so, and, you know, whether you're, you know, the most senior executive at Google or you're just starting on the journey, and anyone who's being successful has a mindset of continuous improvement. And they're always learning. They're always trying to get better, and they're always figuring out who can, who can I, who can help me. And what I've been amazed by is um, the willingness of people. And this is kind of why I've, you know, tried to be doing more like this and other stuff more recently. Is because you know over my journey, a huge bunch of people were willing to meet me for lunch, have coffee, tell me about you know how they dealt with problem X. And the reality is that, um, and I think COVID's driven this even even more is. You know, people uh, uh, care about other people more than we think, you know what I mean? And people want to help other people. Most people aren't so self-absorbed in their own world that if you ask them for help, they're not going to kind of, you know, spend half an hour and grab, grab a coffee and things like that. So, you know, I would, I would, I would say don't, you know, be ambitious with who you want to target. You know, if you, if you, if you contact them and, you know, can connect with them in a way and, and get some of their time and you know you can really start to start to build uh, some good good relationships and you know I think kind of um, you know what I've tried to do is is find mentors that kind of um, you know 
what are the areas where I, you know, know I need to work on and improve? You know what I mean? Where, where who are the who are the experts with with it within there? So, you know, I have um, a CEO coach at the moment who's actually now the chairman of our company, but you know, he's he's been through. He knows our space, but his big thing is kind of kind of leadership and building high functioning teams and building a kind of culture of what he calls red shoes, which means kind of showing up for showing up for each other and just kind of standing out for the positive. And and for me, that's been you know um, there's so many facets to to building a successful company. You can build a great product, but if you can't sell it and you've got a terrible culture you go nowhere. So you can't over index on one area like, oh, we're really engineering, we're really strong on engineering. That's great. But you've got to be able to sell and connect with customers and, and, and market or, you know, ooh, we've got a great culture, but no one wants to buy a product. It's also a problem. You know what I mean? You've got to, you've got to try and, I think as a founder and a CEO, you've got to be advancing. You can't just kind of over index and be like, we're going to be, you know, super good here. You've got to really kind of just level up your skills kind of across that broad base um, as you grow. So I'll uh, I'll stop talking for a second and uh, allow for some follow up uh, questions on the the to- this topic. I think there was quite a quite a few questions that, that touched on the, the kind of subject of of culture, and um, I guess one one thing I'm keen to to understand a little bit more of Dave is kind of one how did you decide on what what culture you wanted for Vox Pop Me, um, but I suppose the the more pertinent one is how did you kind of retain that culture if you did at all. Um, as you expanded um, and you know what what was retained and what had to give yeah I think that's a great question um, so I, th- I think uh, first I'll start off by saying what I don't think culture is culture isn't free lunches and table tennis tables that's that really isn't kind of what um, what it's about although probably my favorite thing about the Birmingham office was the table tennis table but um, that's that said um, um, you know, I think I think um, startups really follow like the culture of of their leader. So whatever traits you have, whether you kind of like it or not, will naturally start to be inherited by your co- by your company. So if you have a bias to action, guess what? The company will have a bias to action. If you are comfortable with um, candid conversations, the company will. Uh, do that it, it you know it, people it tends to follow um the the example set by the senior leadership within within that organization so i would say we you know from our from our perspective um my personal um biases are towards like hey let's let's do so hey, firstly like no goal is in achie- unachievable like it's like set a, set a big goal despite the fact people are telling you can't be done okay you know that's great but we're going to do it we're going to do it anyway our angel investors when we when i told them we were going to the us with less than a million dollars of revenue were like this is a ridiculous idea it's never going to work you can't do this um and we 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 just kind of you know got on and did it because we knew the us was a was a was a big opportunity and a big market and we could continue to grow both sides of of the business so you know i think um you know i think um that comes that comes through i think with uh with the team as well it's kind of you know in the early days i would say we made the big mistake of we basically hired a lot of people um that were like us um so like uh one, one of our you know i played rugby one of our first sales guys played rugby so we basically hired all these kind of people that were very very similar and it didn't uh contribute to building a great culture um and and things like that so that was a big um kind of mistake that i made is actually you didn't get different backgrounds you didn't get different styles of thinking you got you know six guys that were great at selling and like drinking beer together like i mean it was fine but it wasn't the key to building building a great company so i think um you know in order to kind of you you as the leader has to have to set that tone um but then you also then have to bring in uh you know a diverse background of people um to to help run run things out um so yeah i think that kind of neurodiversity is so so important for for having cultures that can just be as you say think think differently and can solve problems in different ways as as well so i think don's raised his hand so i'm going to go to kind of don for a a follow-up question or a new question 
Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so my question is when, when you first start out uh, in terms of the culture, I completely agree with you in terms of it, it's what you as the CEO or, or, or the founders uh, put out there is what becomes the culture of the company. Um, but when you're transversing from, uh, when you're transversing from a, a, let's say startup to a scale up and you're mm -hmm. now getting ready for your series A and things become a lot more, uh, formal, if you like, in terms of procedures and processes and so on and so forth. How do you still maintain that culture of off a startup, if you like, or, or this, do you feel that changes or, or, or becomes something else? Yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I think, um, yeah, at this early stage, you're so scrappy, right? You, you're just trying yeah. to figure everything out. You know, good enough is definitely always good enough. And most of the time, not good enough is good enough, you know, um, when you're, when you're trying to, trying to figure that out. Um, but I, but I think what you, what you can do is like, um, you can over index, oh, we're at this stage and now we have to act like this, which I don't really think is, is, is true. Yeah. Clearly as you grow and you scale, you have to add more, some more processing, some more operational, you know, stuff, some, some, some different ways of, of working, you know, the way you, communicate collaborate as a team the way you know you know before it was like whoever you know the CEO you know like uh, roadmap's a great example like three years ago like I would set the roadmap like I, I don't touch the roadmap anymore like we have a product manager we have a CTO we have a client advisory board that like gets involved in that and things like that so you know it's very difficult to transition from a culture where it's like hey let's do what Dave wants to do to like what is the what is what is um you know in the best interest of the of, of the company and yeah occasionally you have to kind of say hey we just need to get this done but the majority of the time you've got to hire good people um get out of their way and let them do that because you, you wear so many hats in the first two years uh and that's been a challenge for me that like that transition from like you know making every decision to almost making you know zero just like if i'm making a decision like it's either something pretty serious has gone wrong or you know, it's a different it's a pretty difficult decision you know there's you know you hire a great team around you and you don't end up end up kind of um you know as involved in some of those those day-to-day -day decisions because you've got to trust you because again you be, you become the blocker to scaling quickly if you if you if you hold on too tight to all of these things and i need to micromanage that because i used to manage all this stuff you, you you become the biggest problem to your startup scaling. So again, you've got to find you've got to find the right people, uh, empower them to to do that stuff. Tell them you know early on what you expect from them and how you you know how you're going to kind of want to work with them and what your expectations are, and then just get out of the way and let them do do good work. But yeah, I mean, I think it it is a transition as you scale. But I think if you if you kind of have a mindset of, oh, we've got Series A now, so we now have to become this super formal organization that now changes everything. Like, don't forget what got you to where you were and stuff. And it's about kind of micro, um, yeah, you know, micro evolutions and, and kind of getting 1% better every day rather than kind of like thinking, oh, we have to now change absolutely everything about who we are sage advice there dave and, and yeah I've, I've seen it loads and loads with with organizations where the the main blocker is the the senior team or or founder where they just don't get out of the way and and you know they've hired these great people but you know have an unwillingness to empower them so um yeah hopefully that's a, a great lesson there um, i'm going to go to asha next um who's kind of raised a hand i've got a question around when do you know uh, when to start entering international markets. So when did you know to go, go from like Birmingham based to go international? Yeah, so our international expansion was, uh, uh, okay, I've got two stories on international expansion, one that went wrong and one that went well. So um, our, uh, we expanded in two geographies. One was Singapore and one was the US. Um, Singapore was opportunistic. We had someone reach out, knew the space intimately, knew our knew liked what our product was doing. They wanted to invest. They wanted to uh, invest quarter of a million, um, and essentially they were buying a job to be our regional manager for that territory. And this person had a strong agency background. You know, 
on paper looked a great person. You know, we, you know, we were grateful of the angel investment, but we went into a market um, without fully understanding the dynamics there. So we went into the Singapore market, which is a great central hub for all of APAC, but no one in Singapore, like the, it's kind of very, very split up across that, that region. And we ended up kind of, you know, hiring, uh, essentially hiring an investor. And then after a year having to fire an investor, which is a, it, it, from his role, which is a pretty difficult thing to do because, uh, you know, the market just wasn't ready for it. You know, UK, US, mature markets, ready to buy our tech. Um, and, um, you know, it's, it's where, when you look at kind of global spend on the tech that we have, like uh, APAC accounts for kind of 4% of it. So, you know, we, 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 we kind of, you know, we would never have done it if there hadn't have been that investment alongside it. Um, but it was a distraction, right? It was, it was time spent because it was like, oh, we now need Korean text analytics and we need this. And, you know, it was just a, a bunch of stuff and problems that we shouldn't have been working with because even if we'd have solved them, you know, it would have been a, such a small base of customers. Flip then to our US expansion, um, you know, a couple of reasons there. One, so there's a company called InMoment who are based in Birmingham, big CX platform. Um, they're actually kind of owned by a, um, their, their parent company is based in, in Salt Lake, which is why I live out here in Park City, Utah. And we had a mutual client, Tesco, the gro grocery store that was uh, using. So I've been in the US too long. I'm having to explain that Tesco is a grocery store, which is something that obviously you all know. So, um, but yeah, so we had a, we had a mutual client and uh, we ended up demoing them our, them our tech, flew out to the US, met their president, was like 30 people in the room. And they were like, we want to have an exclusive, we want exclusive partnership um, for your technology. We've got 300 clients and this is going to touch on partners as well. You know, this is what we want to do. So we did a contract with them. Our big, I think we were about 700K revenue at this point. Our biggest client was about 30K and they wanted to sign a half a million dollar contract with us, but they wanted exclusivity for 18 months um, to be the only other vendor, CX vendor to be able to kind of resell our tech. So again, um we let the money tail wag the dog a little bit and we kind of did this this deal um and it was great because it was a catalyst to kind of okay i said to the board look i'm going to move to the us it's our biggest contract it allows us to establish a footprint here we can start to hire you know a, t a team here i'll I'll, be, I'll see you in 12 i'll be back in 12 months kind of message well here i am kind of five years later um with the us accounting for kind of 70 percent of our revenue and it was a huge huge catalyst for kind of making that move there. So I would, I would say there's a couple of things around, around timing. Um, be intentional as to why you are going into a specific market. So understand, you know, we're going into this market because X, you know, maybe it's because the, the TAM in the US is, you know, 10 times bigger than the UK or whatever, whatever it is. Um, definitely be, be cautious of uh, expanding into non-core markets. Like the US is a great place to go um out from the uk out, outside of that like there's not many places that make immediate sense straight off the bat unless you unless you're you're at more scale and it, i would argue it's probably easier to scale in the us than saying hey well we're going to attack you know europe and germany and france and and, and all of this stuff so you know i th um i think that you know there's there's people will say, well, you have to wait till this revenue milestone. You have to get to there. Um, I think if an opportunity presents itself, um, then then you should you should definitely consider it. I mean, we as I say, we were we sub a million dollars of revenue, and you know our our um, our angel investors. And again, this is another thing. You know, angel investors are great. Don't let them run your business. Um, they they don't. The, the large majority of them haven't got a clue what they're talking about. They don't know your space. They they fall back on advice that worked 20 years ago. And, and again, like this is not being disrespectful to angel investors, but this is just the reality. I've seen plenty from investments I've been involved in, and you know they come to meet board meetings and and you know talk a lot about kind of how it used to be and stuff. You you know what the market is. You know what the space is. You know yes, of course they can uh, they can give you give you some advice, but that's all it is. It's a, it's a data point, you know, listen to it, take it on board. Um, but, um, you know, really you should, you should, you know, you should make your own decisions. So at the end of the day, that they, they are just an investor. This is still, you know, unless you've signed some really bad terms, 
this is still your company and you make the decisions. So if you want to, if you want to expand internationally and you think you've got a good reason uh, why it and, and you believe in it, uh, even if, even if other people don't, I don't see why you shouldn't do it. Love it. And I saw a few smiles from a, around the virtual room there. So I think that resonated with quite <laughs> a few new people. Um, Simon, did you, did you have a question? I know you had your hand up um, and then you kind of, I think you may have took it down. Uh, yeah, I, I did take it down. I think you, you answered it in a couple of ways, but um, maybe if I, I go with it and if there's anything perhaps hasn't been said, please feel free. But um, it was about, um, you were talking about perhaps um, how founders delegate responsibility down into early teams and things like that. Um, but particularly now that um, getting that scale and, and the, the business growing, what sort of traits did came really valuable um, to your team and ones that maybe actively look would seek out when when you're hiring um was there any secret sauce there um yeah in the in the early stages that team's grow and i think that links nicely into as well kind of uh, a common theme through throughout the introductions which was all around kind of prioritization as well um so yeah i, I think that's a, a great question to be tackled yeah yeah great question yeah i mean i think when you're looking at that um i'm a lot of uh, i'm a big fan of like figuring out strengths and weaknesses and figuring out you know like I want to spend my time doing what I enjoy and what I'm exceptional at so you, your job as a founder is to basically remove anything that doesn't fall into those two buckets as, as quickly as possible so for me like huge vision huge bias to action I want to get here this is how we should get there here's the high level strategy like I'm not the guy who's going to now document that into 20 pages figure out exactly what all the metrics should be you know, measure that, set up a process, train all the team. Like that just isn't that does that just isn't me. So you know what I what I established quickly was you know okay process process and operations. Okay, that is that is things you know that I, you know it's just not in my sweet spot. And it, it uh, you know um, whilst process and engineering processes in my CTO's sweet spot, I didn't want him distracted with a whole bunch of business admin. You know, you're hiring people, HR, insurance, who's gonna look after the office? You know, how are we onboarding people? We need to do new contracts for suppliers. We need to do an MSA. We've got a procurement process to go through with Microsoft. That's a 30 page, you know, document or whatever. You know, so you've got to, you've got to look at that. I think the areas that are causing you um, to do work that you're not good at and the areas that is, is causing you to you know spend spend time that doesn't give you energy you know what i mean and then i think the early hires the early hires are you know the most critical so again trying to find people um you know um the two things i'm looking for most in those early hires is uh kind of that curious curiosity like people that are kind of questioning, well, why do we do it like this? You know, like, is there a different way to do it? And they're, they, they're, just, they're just kind of constantly kind of improving, improving things. Um, and then, yeah, just a, just a pace, you know what I mean? I think, I think the moment you bring someone into an organization who's like it, it level dips, you know, and again, sport analogy, right? If you've got 11 people playing and a couple of people start playing below where they can play, all of a sudden, so does everybody else, right? So you've got to bring people in that are going to, you know, turn up every day and play the game at the same level you do. Because as soon as soon as you start to bring in, um, you know, people who are willing to play the game at a seven out of ten, all of a sudden, you know, the average across the team the team drops and, and things like that. And the challenge is, it's really it's really hard to interview for some of that stuff. There's you know, uh, I've become a big fan of using kind of um, a couple of kind of standardized tests in in um, in the interviewing process that kind of benchmark people, you know, on from a personality and from a kind of intellectual problem solving capability. Because again, like for me, that problem solving capability is such a core. If you if you have smart people in the room and smart people that are driven, like nine times out of ten, you'll figure it out. So I think it's really important that. Um, you know, you do that. And another thing I guess I'll touch on while we're there is um, I made multiple mistakes and almost keep doing the same mistake. When someone isn't a good fit and you know they're not a good fit, move on. Don't, I know it's easier to say than do, to, uh, easier said than done, but like do not sacrifice your culture and what you're trying to do to, to accommodate one person that's kind of 
affecting that negatively. I don't care if that if that's the sales guy that's bringing in a, a girl that's bringing in, you know, you know, sixty percent of the revenue. If they're creating a toxic culture, like there's plenty of salespeople out there that can do that can bring you the same results without without doing that. So, you know, I think uh, you know at times we've we've hired the wrong person. We've probably realized within 90 days, we've hired the wrong person and we should have made that, but we kind of, you know, don't, uh, we, we, we wait too long. We wait 12 months. We wait, you know, uh, a year and a half and things like that. And all that creates is, you know, you're frustrated. You, your, your colleagues are frustrated um, because that person isn't, isn't the, you know, at the level that you, you need. And Chris has got his hand up. Keep my job for you there. There you go. Sorry, sorry, Alex. <laughs> oh, no, it's just it's just the leader in me. I'm just like, yeah, just... happy days. No, if you could, um, I think we've got two Chris with a hand up. So I think we'll go to yeah, Chris Woods. I think you've taken your hand down. So we'll go to you first, and then we'll go to Chris Thompson. No problem. Well, Dave, that was a nice little plug for my digital human recon because we hire for passion. <laughs> uh, so I'll have to I'll have to show you that that digital human recon. Yeah, yeah, like to see it. Um, so because that does the background, and, and again on the passion on that. But the, the couple of questions I have. Um, one, the way we look as a business, uh, and again, we're a relatively small business, to be fair. If you look at across the globe, Manila, um, the UK, uh, and Ohio, we're raising up our money. We're probably about 40 employees, 35 employees. Okay. We have lots of associates, so we have a lot of people that we bring in as and when we need them. Um, but one of the key elements for us as a business is to, <clears throat> excuse me, is to scale through partners. And we've grown organically by, you know, customers like DPD, Logic Carlos, et cetera, using us, white labeling our services or white labeling mm -hmm. our human recon or our, or our threat intelligence or our security operations center. And what we're really targeting, and, and here's the question really, is getting sales is hard. Uh, and if we can just go to someone who's got, and there's a couple of conversations around at the moment, they've got 30,000 customers or they've got 50,000 customers. We're very good at doing cybersecurity. That's what we live, that's what we breathe, and that's our passion. Are we great at getting clients? Well, I've got Stuart, our global commercial director, on the phone. So, yeah, obviously, we have. Yeah, yeah. But, but, but ultimately, could we do better in doing that? Absolutely. And, and one of the, I just want to know some of the challenges. For us, we want a partner. We've got a big target this year. Uh, mm -hmm. And I want to see how you got on with that. What the, you, you can see where my head's at and, and how it Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that was my one. And if I can get a second question in, and uh, sure. uh, as a fellow Brummy, I'm sure you give me an extra question. Uh, is, um, <laughs> it's, about, it's about the scale up. So, again, we didn't take investment, so we bootstrapped this. And, and if you speak to my our CEO, he thinks we're a little bit crazy. Um, when did you take investment? Was it right at the beginning? And how, and then was it just a case of, I need to, I need to reinvest, I need to, sorry, reinvest, I need to raise money, and you're on that trend. Yeah, yeah. Can you give me a little bit of an insight into that and, you know, looking back what you'd have done different and what you've done better? So there's my two questions. Hopefully, Dave, that makes sense. But the first one, yeah, and problems and challenges. Yeah, the funding question, get ready for a therapy session. So, uh, yeah, thanks for <laughs> allowing me to talk about that. Um, but on the, yeah, so let me talk partnerships first. Okay, so, um, and again, I, like, my experience isn't is just one experience right so this doesn't mean just because i said this happened to us that you you guys should or shouldn't progress it and things like that you've got to kind of make your own decisions around that for sure and every industry is different and different partners are different but um we've uh in the last three years been through four vps of partnership uh and that's because fundamentally we have a product that should partner extremely well with people it should uh, integrate into other people's platforms it should be incredibly easy for us to either oem our tech into that platform or to have some kind of referral reseller model uh, where their team brings our team in and we sell together and we we kick them back and things like that and we've exper experimented with all all kinds of models um, at the moment our um, last year I think we did about 400k of ARR through through partners, so it was about eight percent, seven percent. This year we're trying to do 1.4 million through partners. Um, we've we've exper experimented with different models. Yeah, as I say, some hey we have some tech, you have a platform, put our tech into your platform. Some white label it. Some say it's powered by Voxbot Me, depending on 
you know, who they are. And we're talking like the biggest players in the field. So Qualtrics, uh, in moment, you know, a leader, like the largest players in our space. Uh, we've pretty much kind of got them all or a large proportion of them kind of using this. What we've found is that like um, in the event of where they OEM it, they're not as good at selling it as us. They don't sell the benefit. It becomes a feature that they want to be able to tick a box when Forrester do an audit that says, have you got video feedback? Yes, we've got it. But they're not really bought in um, potentially on, on, uh, on, on selling or not putting that effort in. The other side of that is the reseller model where you know they're bringing us into deals and we're kind of uh, selling a lot selling alongside them so you know, I, I chuckled when you said 30,000 clients because I hear that number uh, in every update from my partnership guys these guys have got 30,000 clients 1500 uh, 1500 um, 1500 sales people where you know we've got we've got six sales people it's going to massively accelerate our growth but the challenge is like the partner's priorities are not your priorities yeah. and you're kind of essentially disintermediated from that sale so you know and we've done all this stuff we've you know we've met we have regular qbrs we set annual goals we do account mapping we uh look at kind of you know deals that they're in you know how do we get into their install base but you know a lot of these a lot of companies that you know they're you know all companies you know they're not always as good as they uh, want to be at upselling to their existing install base so whilst they have this huge amount of kind of install base okay you know how good's their customer success team our sales team still involved in going and upselling the client you know and then uh, when i look at someone like qualtrics huge huge player you know we're one of 200 partners so like we're like wow why aren't the reps remembering any of the stuff we've told them it's because they have a different partner company coming in every third day telling them why they're the latest and greatest and you know when they when you've got a team of a thousand people it's hard enough to train them on your own product let alone like make them subject matter experts on that so i think partnerships is still a key part of a growth strategy it is something thing but what i would caution is it always takes longer and much longer than you think so we've been like I, i've been burnt three three years in a row um like putting bigger expectations on partner pipeline because you have all these good conversations you like this is you know this is going to do it and then then nothing right. end up with a lot of people or a lot of what i call barney partnerships you know i love you you love me but you know okay great but where's the revenue yeah. um so you know that that's that's the challenge you know partnerships that make a great press release they don't always make a great p l great feedback no cheers dave thank you um and then yeah fundraising um yeah so we raised we raised 23 million in total um i was um fortunate slash unfortunate to have some angel investors um that i was connected with prior to um setting up vox me so when we set up vox me they were already investing in other companies that i was kind of bringing them and saying hey what look at this or you know and things like that so i was kind of sourcing deals for them um so we set Voxbot me up um initially um with uh those guys and because of tax um things we invest uh we raised about 300k to start of which i put about 100k in and some other investors put some some of the, the rest of the money in uh, and that was because of the seis limit was 30, so i owned 30 percent and then put my 100k in and we put some some other bits some other bits in as well and so we raised money from the start and what that forced us to do was one it allowed us to you know obviously hire a few more people than we could afford and you know um but what it created was very much like a focus on like like get revenue get any revenue so we you know we what we ended up doing was acquiring bad revenue so we went to market with a model where we sold our product in a project basis um uh, you know, our angels were kind of like, well, if we hit this much in revenue, you can have some more, you know, we'll do some more investment and we'll do this, which was great because it was hitting, you know, a revenue goal, but it wasn't SaaS revenue. It wasn't subscription revenue. Uh, we It forced us to do stuff with the product like, oh, this client wants to do this and they'll pay us 40 grand if we do it. Well, we need to hit that because we've got to get the thing. Is that, is that kind of key to our core product roadmap and what we want to do and what we would need to build? Well, not really, but, you know, 
we'll get the engineering team to spend two weeks on it because it gets us to that next funding milestone. So it created a lot of um, kind of, um, you know, suboptimal activity to, to, to get to uh, particular milestones. Um, we raised money through Mercia Technologies, um, who was our first institutional investor. So we ended up probably doing six, six angel rounds, six seed rounds. So it's like 300K and then 400K and then another 250, then we did 900, then we did 500. And then we finally did a, an institutional round. So what we had was this constant cycle of never having enough money, right? So we, we, it was like we were raising every six to seven months, which meant everything we did was very, very short-term focus. Everything was just to get to that next milestone. And, you know, I think there is obviously a different funding climate in the UK to the US around, um, you know, seed stage, early stage things. You know, there's... You know, I'm sure you've all met with some angel investor who's asked you to for a five or 10 year plan. Like the next time someone asks you to do that, I would, I would just say, I don't think you're a good fit for us. Any angel investor who's asking a seed stage company to write a 10 year plan doesn't know what they're talking about. How could you, it's just, you may as well just put any number on that plan. You've got, you've got to really find, find angel investors that, that understand that. The other mistake we made is we, we brought in angel investors. I think that had an expectation that we, that their money was going to be the last money. And I had an expectation that their money was the first money of, you know, a hundred million dollars we were going to raise over the next 10 years to become a, you know, unicorn company. Um, and maybe that wasn't clear enough at the start to them. So what happens is you start to get misaligned expectations. You know, so now we have a company that's worth 75 million uh, based on our last funding round. Um, but those angels want to get their money out, you know, and so there's a lot of tension between, okay, well, you know, we're, we're raising a primary round. Well, we want secondary. Well, we're not raising secondary at the moment and things like that. So you have to be very um, cautious as to, you know, um, you know, be very honest with your investors as to, you know, what, where, you, where, you're, where you're going and what you, you think for that company. Um, and, um, you know, the other mistakes we made early on in funding is we did, we took a lot of priced rounds. You know, like we, we had an MVP, we'll do a priced round. We'll, you know, we got some revenue. We did a priced round, uh, pretty low valuations. And the impact of that is obviously d dilution for you as the founder, um, which is difficult. Like once you've lost that stock, it's difficult to get back. Now, credit to our VCs and, and, and things like that. They reallocated the options for, they moved some stuff around and, you, you know, they, they, they kind of, you know, at the end of the day, they realize they need your head in the game and you need enough skin in the game to make this worthwhile to you. So, you, you know, you can um, make some progress when you when you do venture rounds if you have made some mistakes. But, um, yeah, I think it's, you know, it, it's one of the things I would have done differently now, knowing more about knowing, knowing more about funding is I would have raised money in, a, in probably more of a convertible note or a safe type fashion until we're at a point where you can actually value this company because when you when you're pre-revenue you know or you're you, you have a tiny amount of revenue um you know how are you really valuing it you know mm -hmm. it's an idea it's a potential it's a team and things like that and um that's the you know that's that's there whereas with a convertible note you know essentially that note will convert to equity at a, on a price ground when you raise raise proper money now Again, that might be like a US bias, you know, so I'm not sure how many convertible notes are being thrown around in Birmingham right now. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Well, not, not enough in my opinion, um, which is kind of, um, yeah, a, a, an interesting topic because we're, we're going to be looking at actually bringing some US investors um, to this forum um, to have conversations with um, the, the cohort because I think that, there's a, a tendency right now to focus too much on investment opportunities within the region. And even if you look at Bristol, Manchester, and, and some of the investment that they're seeing in their tech and digital companies, the, the majority of which is coming from outside the, the region, um, you know, majority London. But actually, if, if, if you look at some, some of the tech nation data and, and deal room data, actually for the first time we're seeing like US investors invest a lot into uk firms because of you know the, the way the markets are right now so there's a huge opportunity for organizations to tap into those us investors 
and tell a compelling story and and then yeah kind of activate and, and utilize some of those convertible notes so we're going to be doing a whole session on on investment um but yeah as as it has been throughout this whole whole session dave some great great advice there um so we're gonna to go to chris thompson next he's had his hand up for, for quite a while so over to you chris uh hi there i should take my hand down um wow we've covered some ground uh i wanted to uh sort of on the partnerships question, but actually relating back to Asha's earlier question, I might have misheard you, Dave, um, but I was really interested in the Catalyst uh, deal, um, the exclusive deal that you talked about that um, kind of took you over to the States. I firstly wanted to just qualify, I'd got it, I'd got it right, that it was an exclusive deal uh, that, that was the Catalyst to do that and, and to take you over to the US. Um, and then secondly, I wanted to ask how that's going. Presumably, um, you're outside of that exclusivity now. How, yep. long was it, how long was it for? How did you get out of it? Did they want to retain exclusivity? Because we're really concerned about the right model for market expansion. And, you know, yep. but yeah, that's the question. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Uh, yeah, so they, um, the deal was structured in a way where they had a couple of things. They had, they had exclusivity. It was a contract that was uh, 100K up front. And it was 15k a month for the first 16 uh, six months then it went to 30k a month for the next six months and then it was going to 100k a month after that um to maintain the exclusivity the other term that they asked for was a rofa which is a right of first refusal which basically means if someone wants to acquire you they get the right to um essentially match that deal or come up with come up with a with a with a better better offer if, if you were going to be bought as they had a thesis that you know there was a lot of people who were going to be interested in this tech and and, and things like that um so um it was a great deal for establishing our u.s presence mm. it wasn't a great deal from a u.s from an exclusivity perspective so um for a couple of reasons one you know it the money from that deal uh saved us having to do another kind of you know angel type you know funding so it was a it was it was attractive from that perspective but probably within three to four months of doing that deal you know all of their competitors were coming to us all of the you know the rest of the market was now like well we want to work with you and we've got delta airlines or you know how can we work together on this and we're like oh we're well, sorry we you know we're we're in this exclusivity so it you know it was um you know hind hindsight's a wonderful thing I would be, I would be very, very careful, like um, to the point where, you know, I, I don't think I would sell my soul again and do an exclusive, an exclusive deal. Um, in in hindsight, there's it is, it is very few times if you, if you are growing and scaling, you know, you, you know, it feels good for the first few months, but, but, yeah. but it was the catalyst to get you to where you are though. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, it is, as I say, these, uh, these uh, things are kind of, um, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty, right? It's easy to look back and say, if we hadn't have done that, we wouldn't have done this. Or if we did, we hadn't have done this deal, we wouldn't have moved to the US. So yeah, so, you know, absolutely, um, from a global expansion ability to establish ourselves there was great. Um, fortunately, it was because we put those kind of tiers into the contract when they were, they, when they were, uh, going to the 100k step up there was a natural break clause so again right. i think if you are going to do it you know like certainly don't sign up for anything that you know just, what seems like a lot of money in year two isn't a lot of money in year four if you're if you're kind of on yeah. the trajectory you want to be on so really make sure you kind of like hey you can have exclusivity but this contract needs to be you know growing at a, a higher growth rate year over year than you were expecting so, so were you able position. to um were you able to step away at that break point and, and say, actually, no, actually, we want access to the wider market? Or, or was it, and did it end sort of naturally or was it awkward? Uh, sorry, I'm taking too much time. Uh, no, no, it was, yeah, it was, it was fine. I mean, as, as I say, no, it, it, I mean, it, it, it ended well. I mean, as I say, the, the president of that company is now our chairman. Uh, so, um, you know, he, he's since left that company and, and, and stuff, but yeah, he's, he's now our chairman. So yeah, no, it built good relationships and we were able to step away. So yeah, you, you just got to go into it kind of thinking about, um, because what seems like a big deal, as I say, in year two, in year four, when you've got, you know, you just don't know who's going to come knocking. And as soon as you sign that exclusivity, you, you, you're pretty bound and you know, you never know what's in front of you. 
Thank you very much. Yeah, helpful. I think I, kind of making sure that that kind of contract has got lots of break clauses in and, and um, it's watertight is um, very, very kind of essential. Um, right, so we've got four people with their hands up now. I was going to go kind of three questions, five minutes per per question. We're going to have to kind of do them slightly quicker. Um, so I'm going to go to Rich first. Um, so Rich, over to you, and then we'll kind of try and take it three, three minutes per yeah. answer if we can. I'll be more succinct with my answers. Sorry. You'd be great. It's just kind of yeah, yeah the times against us. Uh, so my question, I guess, Dave, was was more around customer acquisition. Obviously, mm -hmm. we're in the B two B space and uh, have, have grown pretty much organically to date. We've had very little spend from a marketing perspective. Um, so there's sort of two two sides to it. We know now we need more leads to get to the next step, I suppose, of of revenue. Um, yep. And one tactic, I suppose, to do that is is giving away free trials of the product, whatever that looks like and I've, I've mm -hmm. I see it's something that you do um but it, but equally I've had lots of conversations where a free trial has almost diluted your product because people haven't committed to it as much as they maybe would have done if they were paying for it up front so yep one's around that as a tactic and, and the second obviously the the gold standard really is that we've, we've got to get to a, a fully SaaS business I suppose where we're almost you know onboarding new clients as we sleep my worry for that at the moment is I feel a lot of the value is in the relationships we build with customers from a you know actually having a conversation with them and looking them in the eye even though it's over mm -hmm. zoom and obviously that can be lost as as we scale so is there a balance to be struck there i suppose yeah so um with the second question i, I mean i think um as you try and um as you try and kind of scale um you know, you can be a SaaS business without, you know, it doesn't mean you have to have like, here's three pricing plans, put your credit card in, you know, uh, and all that stuff. I think with the free trial, there's, there's, you know, there's, there's definitely pros and cons of it. Um, you know, the first thing I would say is outside of any of that, what's really important to do is to set up your funnel, right? So agree kind of what a lead is, agree what an MQL is, agree what a sales accepted opportunity is, track all of those on a per rep, per region basis, really make sure you've put the time in to set up kind of lead sources and attribution. Um, ideally, you know, start with a first touch attribution, but you know, later on as you become more sophisticated, you'll start to look at kind of multi-touch attribution because there's a whole bunch of things that contribute to to that to that sales side of things. Um, I would say that with the with the free trial, we went to mark we went to market um, with the ability we knew people did our, our average subscription is about 40k largest subscription is about 250k um we we basically uh more recently we tried to go down market and have a full self-serve option put your credit card in you know 500 bucks a month thousand bucks a month and it's actually pretty hard to go from kind of enterprise mid-market down to the smb and you know a lot of people go you know they start small and then they start selling bigger enterprise deals it's kind of hard to go down and we, we kind of did that for 90 days and put it on pause for now because it was becoming a distraction and a bit cannibalization cannibalization of our kind of core enterprise business um but what the way we've gone to market is we have a small pilot period where it's uh 30 days uh unlimited video seven and a half thousand dollars because i agree with you yeah when when you give something away for free um you know, you're not getting much buy-in from from the customer. So, you know, we'll do we'll do what we call a proof of concept, which is just like quickly run a video study that we choose about their brand and give them access to the platform just so they can see it. But if they want to really go further, we we um we 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 need them to pay for a pilot, and that's kind of seven and a half k. Um, and then, Rich, what what was that first question again? No, the first was about the trial. The, the second was, I suppose, the losing the customer service and, and, and how that translates in a SaaS world. But I think we're already seeing already that having a combination of digital and a people-driven sales process is probably going to be the best model for a, a length of time right now. And I guess that's what you have to with sales representatives and that sort of stuff. Yeah, I mean, there's a really great presentation that uh, on Sastra that Thomas Tungas does around all this, around like, what's your ACV size? Should it be BDRs? Should it be a supported sale? Should it be there? And what are the conversion rates you should see? So okay. um, I'll try and dig that out and send it to Janice and you can share it with Amazing. the group. But this, yeah, that, I mean, that's probably one of the best uh, resources of uh, this. If you're not familiar with Sastra, 
um, and the Sastra University. It yeah, it has incredible resources on pretty much every uh, subject from uh, from you know uh, revenue leaders, CEOs, VPs of product, all kinds of things from some of the biggest companies, and it's and it's all free. Amazing. Um, Thanks. Yeah, follow, follow Jason Lemkin on Twitter. You won't go wrong. Perfect. Thanks, Dave. No yeah, what a resource. It's um, been following that for years. It's great. Um, and then, Cooper, if we go to you quickly. All right, thanks a lot. Um, well, Dave, I, I've got to admit, when you were talking about your, your early stage investor journey, I came out in a sweat because that's exactly what we went through in my first startup. So I completely understand that. And it, it's, it's a good lesson learned. Um, in, in terms of just kind of a, a question that's slightly different. So when you think about the journey when you guys started with a few beers in Birmingham, uh, and where you are now um, as an organization, out of 10, how would you kind of rate that vision versus the reality side? Uh, in terms of like, where did we want to get to and where are we? Yeah, now? and where you are now, yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a difficult question. Uh, I would say, I would say a seven. And the reason I would say that is because, and I think what happens is as you, as you grow, you kind of, I think it's important as you grow to look how far you've actually come. And, and because it, a lot of the time it kind of, you know, you have these aspirations and, you know, particularly in the venture world. I mean, I remember one year we grew at 130% and our, our investors were unhappy because we told them we grew to grow at 160. And you're like, okay, well, you know, so you've got to celebrate those successes and, and things like that. And, you know, that's down to, you know, Built, being forced to build financial models that you know have got little more than hope built into them there's like a lack of predictable scalable revenue because you've got no data to be able to build a predictable scalable model um so yeah I, I would say that you know um it's we've done we've done we've done pretty well uh it's taken a little bit longer than we wanted to to get certain places and that's probably because miss you know a couple of missteps and you know on on hiring as we've talked about and you know product in terms of going down kind of oh we're going to build this and, and you know really not staying true to our vision i think the biggest thing that slowed us down is saying yes too often and in the early days you'll get early customers asking for a whole bunch of stuff and my advice would be to protect that roadmap and protect that vision because it's very easy to say yes to, you know, client A is a big client for us, you know, at the moment, let's say, and they're 20K a year, which is a big client for you, maybe at the stage you're at. But if you start building a bunch of stuff for like client A, you know, soon they're not that a big client, but you've still got to support that tech. You've still got to continue to upgrade that, that tech. So you end up kind of doing a whole, whole bunch of stuff. So, uh, and then the other thing I would say is we've, uh, you know, and being, pretty candid here i would say we've brute forced our product market fit like there's uh the, the book i would recommend reading uh is called from impossible to inevitable again it's by um jason lemkin but yeah probably one of the best books on startups that i've i've ever read um and the reality is like you're like well you know you've got microsoft diageo verizon you know all these huge brands as clients so you've obviously got product market fit well the reality is, is yeah, we've done really, really well to get those brands, but like we still, even at this stage, aren't on at a point where I can just pour money into a marketing funnel and guarantee, you know, every rep hits quota, um, all of all of this, you know, all of the stuff that you would want to see, you know, low low churn rates, great net revenue retention, great product usage. We have it in pockets and things like that, but we're still trying to figure that out. So that's why I'd say a seven because it's like. On the surface, it, it um, you know, it's 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 uh, it's a great business, great story, a great valuation, you know, all of that stuff, and you know that all of that's true. It's just, you know, uh, you know, um, I'd like it to be a bit more predictable. We're still having to, we're still having to figure stuff out, and you know, we're, we're eight years into this, and we're still kind of figuring out how do we scale, and you know. Prior to COVID, uh, events were a huge part of our like customer acquisition. We'd go to industry trade shows, we'd buy lots of beers, we'd host dinners, we'd you know just you know we'd be the kind of like you know um, company that people recognise, which which has been really good for brand awareness. We were ranked number one in the world for qualitative research and all that stuff. But as soon as those events disappeared, we didn't have a digital channel. Um, that was really that well established to drive high quality lead MQLs that converted at a, at a point. 
which then forced us to kind of be like, okay, well, maybe partners are the answer and they've helped, but partners is slow. So like that didn't solve the problem either. So you still, you know, you still, uh, you know, um, you still, you're always figuring it out, I guess is what I'm saying. That, you, that journey never stops. Yeah, it's, it's, it's been important to kind of spending your time to analyze that funnel, isn't it really? And, and ensure that you are kind of constantly optimizing it. There's no no easy way of, of kind of, you know, forming the right go-to-market strategy. Um, but we are, we are going to do a separate session on that, actually. We're going to drill down into what it is to, to form a world-class go-to-market strategy and, and customer acquisition model and funnels and all, all the rest of the lingo that goes into all of that. So, um, yeah, it should, should be a good one. Um, so we've got, um, Don, I think you've got your hand up. So we've got four minutes. So, um, yeah, there you go. Yeah, so, so mine's a funding question. Um, what was the most difficult funding round and does it get easier over time? Uh, yeah, um, I think the way funding gets done changes over time. So, you know, angel seed rounds is very much, it's all about the team. Like, do I believe this, to, is this are they solving a problem that's genuine? And is does this do I have some belief in this team? Uh, at a Series A, I think you're looking for kind of various traction uh, pro points of pr uh, proof of product market fit, really, in in in, in Series A. Uh, and then as we come into a Series B, it becomes hugely metrics driven. You know what I mean? Like at a Series B level, people care less about the problem you're solving. It's like how many reps have you got? Are they all on quota? How much can you generate? Like it's super data data driven so i would say like it starts you know if series b is super data driven and super uh, seed round isn't about the team and the problem it kind of you know changes along that continuum as you as you as you go um i think the 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 hardest round was probably that first um probably our second like our series a1 because we brought in a u.s investor we brought in another UK investor. They had completely different theses on in kind of investment style. So our UK investor wanted to take fees, uh, like monthly fees plus, uh, you know, a percentage, like a, a placement fee and all this. And the US investors like, well, well, so when we have to issue our US investor a warrant because the warrants will, if they're getting it, we, I, they're like, we don't even have a mechanic to take fees on a, on a, on a deal like this, but we're not going to let them take an extra 50K off that. So we want a warrant for that. So just dealing with like those two different cultures. And then I would also say that kind of the due diligence that some UK investors require at a series A stage is frankly insanity in comparison to, um, you know, and me and Yannis have talked about this a lot. And, you know, I've had the, the pleasure of seeing both sides of of how it's done and 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 just you know there's the in the uk at the moment the majority of investors are still kind of private equity type companies that have launched venture arms and there's they have investment committees and they you know they want to go through rounds and present multiple times to their investment committee and then present to their board and like whereas you know our invest in the us is like we met it. We met. We met them. We met the team. We got a term sheet. Like, let's go. Whereas uh, our UK investor, we had to spend fifty k on commercial due diligence, twenty k on this due diligence. It's like it's just it's a completely different world. And I think you know, in in terms of you know, uh, you know, the only the the world is going to become. I think you're already starting, as Yana said, to see more US funds doing more early stage stuff in Europe. Um, and I think that will be a good thing because I think it will force a lot of the kind of um, larger um, early stage players, in, particularly in the region, to uh, hopefully uh, uh, you know change change the, their approach to things because it's just it's you know if we want to put Birmingham on the map as a technology thing, we've got to get out of our way a little bit and bring in the right capital and the right type of thinking. Um, and again, you know, we we see it all the time. You know, one investor thinks burn rate is fine here. Another one thinks burn rate should be down here. So like, we're, you know, I seen a board meeting where one investor is talking about a path to profitability and the other one's talking about how do we grow faster and spend more money? Like that's quite difficult to manage as a CEO. 
because like someone's going to be disappointed. And if you aim for the middle, you're probably going to you're probably going to keep no one happy. So it does create some uh, some challenges as you uh, as you expand globally. Just different mindsets. I, I do think that um, the Birmingham um, brand that we have or that Yanis is building is 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 borderless, uh, although it's focused on um, entrepreneurs in Birmingham initially. Uh, but it shouldn't. It shouldn't be. It sh it sh we should be able to uh, raise funds, more monies from wherever, whether it's the the US or or elsewhere. And and I, and I think, would you, would you, if you had to go back, would you have gone straight to the US to try and raise funds, or stayed in the UK? Or, or yeah, I mean. I I, th I think it's I think it's a bit like what I was saying to Chris with that in moment deal. It's kind of easy to say now being here and lived here five years and look back and say, you know, we wouldn't have done this or our angel deal we could have better structured or whatever whatever it might be. I, th I think if you you know, um, I, I don't think it's as easy as just kind of rocking up in the US and, and getting some cap getting some capital because whilst there's an abundance of capital out here, you know, you, you know. There's an abundance of very, very smart people working on very, very difficult problems as well in the US and stuff. So it's like, you know, there's this competition in Birmingham, but you know, in the you know, that that we're now competing on a global landscape, right? In terms of talent and, and things like that. And good ideas can come from come from anywhere. I think it's great to see this kind of um, you know, even the larger funds are kind of like expanding, you know. There used to be, you know, unless you went to Stanford and knew someone who worked at the venture fund, you weren't getting funded. And at least there seems to be a, a little bit more of a, a, a leveled playing field uh, coming. But that, that change is, is, is still slow. But I mean, it's, yeah, I, don't, I think it's difficult to just kind of land in the US and get funding. I think you've got to um, have some, some things, but uh, some, some kind of traction or some, some meaningful, meaningful traction. But, it, but it, again, once you have some meaningful traction, it is pretty easy to get an E2 visa and come to the US. Uh, and that's the one other thing I would say is like, I think if I'd have hired someone to run the US for me, it wouldn't have been anywhere near as successful as me coming in and being in that market. And so I think we got the best work of both worlds by leaving our CTO and building a, a core engineering product team in, the, in, in Birmingham and then building out a more commercial go-to-market team in the US was kind of really the best of, best of both worlds. And, and did you do that when you were still single or did you have a partner that you had to bring with you? Uh, yeah, no, I have uh, my wife uh, and two kids came with me. So it's kind of like, hey, we're moving to Salt Lake City. And she's like, what? And I'm like, yeah, well, just for a year. And like, no one really knows much about Salt Lake City, but it's kind of, um, yeah, in Utah. And uh, it, yeah, it was it was a good experience. And yeah, my, my wife actually um is our vp of operations so she's worked in the business for some time so she had a, has, has a good um uh, understanding of what we're what we're doing and, and things like that so awesome that i mean what what a personal and professional journey um, <laughs> yeah. lots of lots of fun um, along the way um so unfortunately that's um all we've got time for i think we could have gone on for another hour and a half actually um and look i think if people have got questions it's always the case isn't it we kind of finish these sessions and then people have got questions so um dave are you all right kind of you know we've taken taken some of this offline and and firing you a few questions via email if, if i can kind of yeah yeah um, for sure them. yeah sure and then i'll um yeah if you send them across and then maybe i'll like record a loom or something and send you send a video response back awesome yeah oh, there you go utilizing video um okay. well look thanks for your time i know you know it's super early there um so go and have a, another coffee um but yeah like like simon's just said actually thank you so much for all your um wisdom um advice insight and um yeah and um, hopefully we can now kind of start to turn birmingham into kind of that that global tech hub um and start to bring in some, lots and lots of expertise and, and investment from further afield so no thanks thanks once again um have a great day and um yeah everyone else have a have a great day too cheers yeah Brilliant. absolutely thanks thanks, thanks for having me cheers. Thanks, thanks, appreciate it. Thanks, 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 thanks everyone, yeah, yeah, everyone. good luck cheers. with everything everyone all right thank you bye thank you.